All right, now here we are on part two of our first week of data screening. So we just finished accuracy and now let's start looking for missing data. The easiest way to look for missing data is using a summary function okay? or any of our other summary functions that we talked about in the first couple of weeks. And we could use apply, which we'll do in a minute to sum the number of values. And so if you have hundreds of columns, summary can be quite tedious. I don't have, I only have 20 here, but I can already tell I've got some missing data in age, grade, and my resiliency scale. So let's see if I can make that a little bit faster to read by only grabbing the NA values. So I'm using apply here on my no typos data set. We're gonna change data sets in a minute. Well, one for rows, two for columns. And then when you have a function that isn't available, you know, it's like something you have to do several functions for, you can write your own. So function of X here, so it's gonna pass each column as X as they sum up the question. So this is a logical value, is in A, right? Tells you if the value is in A or not. Okay. If you apply a sum to a true false value, all of the trues become ones and all of the falses become zeros. So it's very convenient because now I can sum up the number of values that are in A. And this gives us essentially this row of data. It's a little bit easier to read. So we have one missing variable for gender, one for age, none for socioeconomic status, one for grade, and so on. But really it's not the number of missing points that's important, it's the pattern of that data. So let's talk about that concept. And it's really like missing data is like out of all of them, one of the most important pieces okay? because sometimes it leads us to an, a more, another interesting question. So why is this data missing? Okay. Did someone just skip the question? And that's really easy to do when you have these long questionnaires that um, have lots of items. It's easy to miss one. They just get bored, like what, why did someone skip it? Did someone forget to enter it? So if you're transferring the data, maybe you just merged it wrong. Is it a typo or some other issue with answering the question appropriately? So in our case, when we had people who made judgments and they typed in numbers bigger than 100. And that leads us to the types of missing data. So the first type, this is what you want, is called missing completely at random or MCAR. Okay. And you want this type of data because it just means that it's an accident or it's just ran, like it's, it's data, you just don't know why. It's just, but it's randomized throughout the data set. I mean, we prefer no missing data, but if you're gonna have missing data, missing completely at random is the good thing because the other one is missing not at random or MNAR. You don't want that because that implies that there's a reason why it's missing. Maybe it's the survey instrument. Maybe it's the computer program. Maybe it's the programmer. I have made some mistakes before or some other data collection issue. So some examples of those on survey instruments. And I might be conflating my classes, but I feel like I've talked about this example before, if not new to you. Um, we have this in survey instrument that we've used to examine if um, people have drugs or alcohol problems. Okay. And one of the questions on one of these scales is do you use drugs? Okay. And you might say yes or no. So I pick, let's say I pick no. The question right after that is can you quit drugs when you want to? If you mark no on the first one, what do you say the second one? Right? Like, yes, because I don't do drugs, but then it looks like you lied on the first one. Or if I say no, it looks bad because no, I can't quit. <laughs> so there's no right answer there. And so many participants skip that question because I don't do drugs. This doesn't apply to me. So it's a problem with the survey instrument. Um, the problem with a computer program or computer programmer is sometimes we accidentally leave a question off the scale. Oops. So we get about halfway through it and realize, um, this scale has 20 questions and there are only 19 in the data set. So you go back and add it in. Well, I don't want to replace the data from the first half of the participants because that was my mistake and that's not random. 
And so, you know, I've kind of, I've done all of these. So it's not that unusual to have these things happen or a data collection issue. So we've also had our survey platform crash before and people's scores just who are in the middle of it, just no more data. Um, so not at random is not good. That doesn't always mean it's nefarious. Sometimes it's just a mistake. So, okay, what if everyone skips the same question? Potentially it's a bad question, or there are questions that people will skip because um, they just don't wanna answer them. So if you ask people about their sexual, sexual habits, <laughs> sometimes they'll skip questions just because they're uncomfortable answering. So there are ways, there are tests that one can apply to this type of data. I don't think they're, I, there's nothing wrong with them, but I don't think they're any better than um, simply looking at the data. So let's look. And so what should I do? I'm gonna give you kind of a set of procedures, a picture down here at the bottom, but don't replace missing not at random data because that is not at random. So the assumptions we have for our imputation of data in, are no longer valid. Okay. You shouldn't really replace categorical options or demographics of participants because it's probably not appropriate to guess these sorts of things. Okay. And you can conservatively replace or impute is a better word here. Uh, missing completely random data where there's 5% or less to be replaced. Okay. And that 5% has magically has nothing to do with alpha being 0.05, by the way, it is just um, one of those things <laughs> that 5% seems to be a good sweet spot where we don't influence the statistical test in a negative way. Because okay. we are making up data right now. Okay. But we're making it up with a good guess. Be careful when you have small data sets, um, not to replace too much. That's why it's 5%, not like five points. Okay. And we do have to make a distinction between missing data and incomplete data. So participants who quit halfway through the survey don't really have missing data, they have incomplete data. And you really shouldn't replace incomplete data. You should replace it when there is missing data. And that's where this 5% rule will come in. And we'll talk about how to break this down in a second. And so what we've got here is a kind of a uh, graphic. Let's say we have this data. If it's a categorical IV, I've, it just kind of depends, but generally you don't want to replace those, although we do have ways to do it. So stop. If it's a continuous IV um, or dependent variable, if it's missing not at random, stop. If it's missing completely at random, but it's more than 5% of the data, stop. If it's less than 5% of the data, you can use a function called mice. So we're gonna mice the data. And so there are actually a couple of options here. That was really a, a summary of imputation. But I, by creating these different data sets, I can look at the impact of our, the imputation that we're gonna try here on the analysis. So you can actually run your analyses with and without missing data imputed to determine if that affected your results just like we can do that for outliers as well when we get to outliers in a second. So there's a reason. Now we can use our no typos data set as not imputed and our soon to be no missing data set as imputed and test if there are big differences in our statistical test. And so we can exclude an entire participant, um, which means like if they have any missing data, they just get tossed. See you later or that's called list wise, or we can only exclude them when they have the data that's missing for that particular analysis. So when you run correlations, they get excluded when they have the data and excluded when included when they have the data, excluded when they don't. Okay. And that generally is called pairwise. There are multiple ways to estimate or impute the data. So the ones that we can safely estimate, let's do it. And mean substitution for a long time was the most popular way to do this by simply estimating the mean for that column or that variable. And that's a fairly conservative estimate because it doesn't change the value of the mean, which when we're trying to estimate population parameters and we're using the mean as our model, right? That means that we haven't manipulated that mean in one direction or another. However, that does change the variance by pulling it closer to the mean. 
And so with large amounts of in missing data imputed, that can cause a type one error because we're uh, artificially reducing variance. Okay. So think about it as we have our distribution and we start putting points, more points in the middle that shrinks up the variance. Okay, makes the distribution taller and more kurtotic. And that can, can, if we impute a lot of them, cause a type one error. As, uh, as a reminder, which is saying it's significant when it's not. So it's no longer the most popular way. And for a long time, it's really the most popular way because it's easy. Okay, it's easy to estimate the mean and type it in. Okay. Or for, as these computing programs have gotten more popular like R, now the more complex stuff has become easy. I would say MICE is definitely an easy package. It's going to two lines and you can be done. Okay. And so multiple imputation is much popular. So um, MICE stands for multiple imputation chained equations. And the, the advent of R, and I mean, SPSS has this, but I think you have to pay extra for it. Don't quote me on this. Um, but most, most major statistical programs have this kind of option. Okay. And what it does is it creates a set of a potential expected values for that missing point. And it uses the entire column. So what's the mean of this column? What's the variance of this column? And the entire row. What, is, what do I know about this participant? So that is more informative than using just the columns information. So you can use the entire data frame to inform what that point should be a little better. Because if I know that this participant always picks seven, I should probably lean more towards picking seven than picking the average of that column. And so using some matrix algebra and um, usually maximum likelihood uh, estimation, which we'll talk about way later, <laughs> and the pro it essentially estimates the probability, probability, probably, probably. And I can't find them all. <laughs> probability of each value. Okay. So you know, if this, if the data is all one to seven, what MICE does is it says, okay, here are my options, one to seven. So it will not give you a value that's outside the range of the data. Okay, so it looks at the min and the max, and it also looks at the points of the data. So if the data is interval in the sense of like, it's one, two, three, four, okay, integer, that's the word I'm looking for. It will only estimate it as one, two, three, four. If the data has decimals, it will estimate the data with the decimals. If it's categories, it'll actually pick a category. So that's one thing I love about MICE is it imputes the right type of data. Okay, it's, it's a smart program. It looks at the data type and only estimates based on that data type. Okay. So it finds the probability of each of the potential data values and picks the most likely one given row and column information. The other thing, quick thing that we can do to help us understand this MNAR versus MCAR before we get into how we're going to put all this stuff, um, actually calculate MNAR and MCAR, is the VEM library. Okay. And one cool function for VEM here is AGGR. Okay. You put in the name of the data set. And I did numbers equals true, so I could see the numbers out here on the side. That's the only thing out here. And so what it does is it creates a proportion of missingness. So I can tell kind of right away that maybe there are some columns that have too much missing data currently, because that 5% is kind of our cutoff score. Okay. So it just tells you how much each column has missing. And then I really love this um, combinations chart. Now it gets a little crazy to read sometimes <laughs> if you have a lot of columns, but essentially for the columns that have missing data, so obviously it's, it's not showing me all of them here, 80% of the data is not missing anything. Okay, and that's this blue line here, so no missing. Okay. If a data point is missing, this is either sex or SES, kind of hard to read, um, you know, it's it's uh, only missing here. Okay. Now this participant here is missing this entire block. Okay. So it shows you kind of the patterns of the data. Uh, and if you have a lot of participants that have the same patterns, that's when you know that something went, went wrong. So in uh, NAR, MNAR. Okay. 
but you want these to, to not really have a specific pattern. So you don't want the same two items missing from a lot of people or the same four items missing from a lot of people. And so there's no particular pattern to this. If I, if I miss this first one, um, I'm not always missing the third one. Made a map. Okay. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna find a piece of paper <laughs> to make this demo hopefully more um, palatable. So let's look. Uh, here, we can cut up this thing. All right, this is our data set. Okay, so our data set here <clears throat> is all the data. Okay. And we're gonna break up this data set using some scissors to uh, accurately find the data that we can replace. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is focus on rows. Okay, so we're gonna go this way. These are rows. This is wide data, so we're gonna go wide ways. Got it? All right. So we'll start by examining missing data by rows as we can exclude people who didn't finish or skipped a lot of the survey. So this is what I mean by we have to distinguish between missing data and incomplete data. So since I'm using wide format data, I'm going to exclude all of my participants who just don't, who just quit in the middle. Okay. Or they skipped an entire survey or there's just some reason that participant did not finish because that is missing, not at random. Okay. Or they skipped enough of questions that you're like, they're not paying attention. Okay. So I'm gonna create myself a function here um, called percent miss, because there's not kind of, there's not one in base R. So we're gonna say sum up all of the missing values. Okay. So calculate how many missing values there are, divide that by the number of possible values multiply by 100. So this is a percent thing. So how much of the data is missing by percent? Now in the vim function picture, this is a this is in proportions. So I'm going to do percents because it's easier for me to read. We're going to use apply here on our no typos data set on rows. So this is a one for rows. And use our new fancy percent miss function. I just made a quick table. So I can look here. Okay, so the first row here is the percent of missing values. So there's zero, 5%, 10%, 15, 20, 20 and 70%. Okay. This here is the number of people that fall into that category. So there's 109 with no missing data, um, 16 rows with 5% missing, and then some other small numbers. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is create a set of rows to potentially replace. And um, we can also create a data set that has the participants who we won't replace, but maybe they're going to get used later so we can hang on to them. Okay. So we're going to create two data sets here. We're going to create replace rows and don't replace rows. Sharpie here. So we're going to take our data, we're going to partition it into two parts. And what did I call this? No replace rows. This is a low tech demonstration. <laughs> so I'm going to say replace rows and no replace rows. Whoa, can I get it to not? do the weird filter thing. Okay, replace and no replace. And I'm basing that based on 5% for my missing here. So I'm gonna say subset out my no typos data set where missing is less than or equal to 5% because this is our, our rule of how much we can replace. And then for our no replace, so these people are okay and our no replace, um, we're going to break them into missing greater than 5%. So overall, our um, data set has 137 rows. Our replace rows are 125 participants that we can potentially work on their, impute their scores, and 12 participants we can't. Okay. So we're going to cut off our bad people. 
I hope this demo works. I used to describe this as cake, but I don't have a cake. I have paper. So, okay. so now we've got our replace rows data set and our no replace rows data set. That's the back. Okay. So I'm going to set this one aside and work with just our replace rows data set. Okay. So now I want to examine by column to make sure there are no MNAR issues by column. So did everybody skip the same column? So after I exclude these participants who didn't finish, do we have problematic columns? So are there ones that everybody missed or I forgot to program or whatever? Right. And we're going to make sure that we're doing this on our replace rows data set because we've lost these bad people, the no replace data set. So these are our screwy participants who didn't finish or you know screwing around or closed it or the computer crashed whatever okay so we want to do this on the replaced data set so we've we've lost the bottom half of the data that had a bunch of missing due to incomplete data all right and this you just got to visualize there are trick neat code ways to do this but honestly you just look at it right so are they all less than five percent Yes. So all of these are potentially eligible to continue on to be replaced. However, we should exclude columns that we just shouldn't do. So our demographic data here. Okay. And let me back up. So I'm going to not replace one, two, and four. I really shouldn't replace SES either, but it doesn't have any missing data. So I could keep it in the data set to help the algorithm figure out the best possible answer for each person. But I'm going to exclude one, two, and four because I don't want to estimate those and they have missing data. Okay. Absences is another one that I maybe shouldn't estimate. It's kind of a tricky one because it's continuous, but it's kind of also demographic, right? Um, but either way, that one has no missing data, so I'm allowing it to be used as informative. But if I leave these in the data set, they're going to get replaced, and I don't want to do that. So that's what sex, age, um, SES, and our sex, age, SES, and gender are demographic variables. But we can include these other the we can leave in SES because it doesn't have any missing data. So this is why I'm going to drop one through one, two, and four, and I'm going to make that replace columns. <clears throat> So everything but one, two, and four become replaced columns. And this last piece becomes no replaced columns. And you can come up with whatever names make sense to you. I just like to remind myself which ones are columns and which ones are right. Okay. So we're splitting this into two parts, replace columns and no replace columns. Okay. And code-wise, you just want to make sure that you split the data set on replace rows. So we've broken these pieces up now, except my filter keeps taking them off. Okay, so I've taken this one out. I'm left with replace columns. Okay, it's no longer replace rows. I broke this up. Now we can actually use the mice library to do our business on this smaller data set that we've determined is MCAR. So mice will figure out that type of data based on the column data type and structure and replace it with the same type of data. And it creates, it's a multiple imputation, so it actually creates multiple options to pick from. And we're just going to pick one of those and merge them back in. Okay. Some people suggest you should actually um, calculate your analysis on all of the imputations and average them together, so that's an option or um, sort of maybe average all the imputations down into one thing or uh, you know, randomly pick. There are lots of ways to do this, but we're gonna pick one of those multiple imputations and put it back in the data set. Okay. So we open the mice library and it's so easy. It's like dangerously easy. The function is mice, so we're gonna mice it. And you fill in replace columns here. Okay, make sure you're using replace columns. That's what we're left with. 
That's all we have left. Okay. And what it'll do is it'll run through and it'll tell you what it's replacing. Okay, so it creates five iterations and five data sets. Okay. And so these are all of our columns that got some sort of imputation. And we'll put it back together. So this is where the low tech demo becomes interesting. Okay. So we'll create our no missing data set using the complete function. So temp no missing here is what I named my imputations. But this has like 25 different possible options. So I want to say, you know what, grab the first one. Okay. The default in mice is to run five different imputations. So pick a number one through five. <laughs> I just stick in one. Um, there's no particular reason to pick two or four or five. Okay, or we could average, there's lots of options here, but um, what we wanna do is create our no missing data set that we're gonna start merging back into. Okay. So the current dimensions of our tiny data set is 125 rows by 17 columns. Okay. And so what I have to do is merge them back in the right order. Okay. I cannot merge my bad rows with my original one because my hand is in the way here, but it's wider. Okay. So it won't let me merge back rows first because it's wider here than the original one. Okay. So I can't put these back together. They have to be the same dimensions, okay, when it comes to um, either rows or columns or the same column dimensions. So that won't work. So what I have to do is first put my no replace columns back on. Okay. So I would have to tape this back together first. And that's what we're doing here. Okay. All the columns. So I'm gonna put my demographic columns back on and merge that with no miss. So it's C bind for column bind. And we're gonna put this back together. Okay. So we went from 125 rows and 17 columns to now we have 125 rows and 20 columns. So we put these columns back on. Okay. And then once I've done that, let's see if I can handle this. <laughs> okay, put my columns back on. Now I can put my old rows back on. Okay, the, the pairwise deletion. So we can put our no replaced participants back because okay. now the widths are the same. Okay. So thank you for enjoying my low tech demo. <laughs> um, we would do that with R bind. We put no replace rows, this long one, right, back onto all columns. And so this data set's called all rows. So I could use my all columns data set um, where I have, you know, maybe some missing data and some demographic columns, which is what we'll use here in a minute. Or I can use my all rows data set for pairwise deletion of participants. Okay. So it kind of depends on your goals in the analysis, but that's how you'd combine it together where you have all of the options. And so that brings us to the end of the missing data section. And so we'll finish this out by doing a small section on outliers now that we've dealt with the missing data. So I will tell you that the way we're gonna calculate outliers can handle, can't really can't handle missing data. And so participants, if you're interested in using this form of outliers, um, but also keeping some of your participants based on the analysis, you end up having to do outlier analyses by analysis. Okay. We won't do that here, but we will do that in later sections where we'll keep missing data in different places. But for most purposes, if you need the entire data set and they don't have a point, they're gonna get excluded. And so we'll kind of work with that assumption and calculate outliers on all columns here because they would get dropped from all rows. Because if they don't have the whole data set, you can't calculate the, the numbers you need for outliers. So head on over to our outliers video, which will complete this week's section on data screening.